So uh, first a disclaimer, which is that uh, the leveraging is only starting, okay? So the idea, that image is from uh, some work we did uh, some time ago using narrow mass modeling to a uh, forward model EEG and fMRI and explain uh, the dynamics of the alpha rhythm. Uh, our hope is to fit this within the uh, big brain framework and to then leverage everything that has been uh, presented over the past few days, uh, especially to get uh, to a level of specificity in the model, which will include uh, more anatomical information. I have to say that our models for the EEG and the MEG at this moment are pretty inspecific. So basically, what is the motivation? The motivation is that, uh, and this is the motivation of the Global Brain Consortium, it is that uh, there's a need for uh, imaging modalities that can uh, be in any, uh, used in any population with this advantage. And it's usually, we usually think of lower and middle income countries, but it can also be disadvantaged population within higher income countries. So the Global Brain Consortium it has been moving towards this direction. In fact, you can look at, uh, this is the editorial from a special issue of Neuroimage, on neuroimaging and global health. So I won't uh, go into detail, just recommend you can look at that. Now, one of the things that, uh, that we have uh, been thinking about is that of all the imaging modalities, the one that can serve as a translational bridge is EEG, and it has a high temporal resolution, low cost, and is easily uh, deployable, as we've been able to demonstrate. You'll hear a bit more about that in another presentation from our group later on. And uh, that doesn't mean we, uh, the Global Brain Consortium, we don't study other imaging modalities, but rather that we think that EEG should be a translational bridge. So basically, we have developed and deployed on the uh, Canadian Open Neuroscience platform, specifically CBrain, open software and data that uh, includes uh, the uh, developmental equations for the EEG spectrum at sources, allows comparison of specific subjects to obtain uh, Z-transformed uh, images, which you see on the right. And this has been used in many different settings uh, where the only thing you have to have is an EEG machine. Uh, now, we recently have, because all of this work was previously uh, done with norms from age 5 to 97, uh, which were obtained in Cuba in the 90s in the, in the first wave of the Cuban Human Brain Mapping Project. So the GBC has recently expanded our work. Admittedly, you can see from the map, we still don't have a good coverage of many regions, but by PhD uh, students, Ming Li and uh, Regal Wang, they have worked uh, with the GBC and we created multinational norms that include 1,500 subjects, nine countries, and have created norms using uh, Romanian geometry. There's the, the uh, I won't go into those details, but uh, what we did was federated learning in, in that nobody shared raw data. We were able to correct site problems by using uh, manifold learning and pick out places that had problems with things like the misplacement of electrodes. And we obtained norms which have been tested in learning disability, in the detection of subjects with uh, the prosenilin 1 mutation for dementia, and also in COVID-induced brain disorders, just to mention a few uh, applications. So what we have is a rich data set from many different countries uh, on the uh, normal EEG, variants of the normal EEG, and how it develops. In this case now, we reach uh, from five to 100 years. Uh, these norms are publicly available, both the data for the cross spectra, not for the original EEGs, and all the software to produce any of this type of uh, data. So which directions are we moving in? First, we're moving towards new methods for uh, the, uh, the detection of source connectivity. 
I just want to stress here that the usual method uh, for source connectivity that people use is that here you see it on, on the, the top, and this is work from my uh, postdoc and PhD student, in which you do first an inverse solution, and then from that inverse solution, you obtain a connectivity mechanism. Now, we show in a series of publications that this is wrong, that uh, essentially when you obtain an inverse solution, you're assuming a prior, and that prior assumes connectivity between EEG sources. And that prior is misspecified. So what you have to do is do an inverse solution that we call a one-step inverse solution. It's uh, reflected here, in which at the same time you do uh, the estimation of the EEG sources and the activation at each uh, node that you're trying to estimate the source for. And the only thing you here you have to assume, instead of assuming a wrong or misspecified connectivity, you put a prior on the connectivity matrix. And uh, those of you in machine learning, we're, we're using uh, different types of sparsity, for example, the graphical lasso, for that source connectivity. So this would be a graphical lasso code variance estimation in the frequency domain, but uh, it, it indirectly observed, which is a unique characteristic because you don't observe uh, either the, e, uh, the EEG or MEG sources uh, uh, directly. So one of the directions we've moved in is to use this type, we call this uh, BC Barretta in distinction. Barretta means variable resolution electrical tomography. Uh, this is a modification of the original Loretta. And uh, now this is BC Barretta, brain connectivity Barretta. Now, basically what I want to show here is that, <clears throat> and it's one of the things that I've been mentioning at many places, and I mentioned today, was discussing it uh, with Nicola, why if people are obtaining for the monkey, uh, let's say fMRI, why not obtain electrophysiology? Up to now, to my knowledge, the only uh, gold standard experiment for comparing different methods for obtaining sources is an experiment by Naotaka Fuhi at Ricken. We did a collaboration. He put in an a, 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 a electrocorticogram uh, set of electrodes that covered one hemisphere. You see it up on the top. Uh, what you see then is the estimation of the connectivity um, just on the right, which is using our procedure and then using the two-step uh, procedure. And then we had si he, he simultaneously filled in the holes again and he put in the 1020 system, which is what's used uh, in clinical neurophysiology. And what you have here in the middle is the uh, concordance between the connectivity directly from the electrocortical gram and from EEG inverse solution. So the one-step method that we're uh, pushing has very little distortion. It's measured by the kubak labor distance between covariance matrices. But if you use a one-step method, well, then you get substantial distortions in some places. Here's a summary of those statistics. Uh, BC Vareta is based on what we call a hidden graphical Gaussian uh, spectrum. And then you have the usual, let's say, E Loretta, and you have a substantially higher. Now, this, there's two lessons from here. One, that we need more experiments of this sort uh, to be able, because I would say that there's about 20 or 30 new EEG inverse methods. Every time a new method comes to regularization, somebody applies it to the EEG or the MEG to estimate. And there's very little experiments that allow you to distinguish. We published uh, this data some years ago where we showed that most of the common methods really have substantial distortions and that's why this led us to look at this. So this is one direction in which we're moving and definitely uh, now with all the information available, let's say in a setup like this, we can start uh, trying to explain a bit more based on structural connectivity and also on chemoreceptor activity. So what we've done to facilitate uh, uh, applications 
because uh, what we want to do is to have things that can work even when you don't have access to the internet. And uh, we've developed a pipeline, here's the pipeline, that uh, does essentially uh, the production of, uh, the, uh, the analysis of uh, data, both with the HCP processing standard and with legacy data uh, also, uh, and uh, that is when there's only an MRI, and even when you don't have an MRI, we substitute uh, one of the uh, brain templates. And uh, here we have the different modes. You can see that it includes, you would say, it, it uses substantial parts of the HCP processing pipeline, also of Brainstorm, but it has a, a specifically down here for the, uh, and I'll see it, you'll see it in the next slide, for the EEG source connectivity that we've developed. It has a substantial, uh, it, it, let's say, new software and also analysis of causal relations in uh, the EEG uh, source activation. Of course, it can analyze MEG data. So, one thrust of our work has been to try to align all the stuff that's been going on, let's say, in the discussions of the big brain, with a lightweight application that can be deployed in, let's say, low resources where you don't need to have parallel processing. That doesn't mean that the work with, uh, that, that's been discussed here, we, we discount it. On the contrary, we think it's the gold standard, but we also think that there has to be instruments that then can be placed in uh, lower resources. One of the things that comes up in our discussions in the GBC, and especially from areas that have, uh, let's say, poor internet in lower and middle income countries, is that everything is very well for uh, research, but if we want to go to clinical applications, we need things like this, and we've responded with this type of. So, basically, what have we uh, been able to do? Well, we're using uh, a series of priors to uh, be able to do uh, the uh, EEG and MEG source localization, uh, and we have several improvements with respect to the MEG connectome. Uh, the software that we've developed, we call it Sifty Storm. So the storm is uh, a nod to uh, Brainstorm, which has been essential for working with us. And Sifty is because we're adhering to the HCCP standard, and the output of this is uh, Sifty files, especially for connectivity. So here you see some of the priors. I won't go into detail because I'm just giving a, uh, an introduction to the, uh, to the work we're doing. So this is one thing, which is to put in alignment, in a lightweight software, a, a pipeline that's dedicated to EEG and MEG, but with an emphasis in EEG and EEG source connectivity. Here you see some examples of the, uh, the results that you can obtain. So there you see, what you see on the top is from magnetoencephalogram, we simulated the EEG from the sources of the uh, MEG, and then that's on the bottom, and then you can see in the middle uh, a line to the big brain. So this is to show you can go back and forth between MEG and EEG data, and you can align it to the big brain atlas or to FS average or whatever. So here's a more examples uh, where you have the estimated activation. We don't show the connectivity. We don't. We still don't have a good way of plotting, you know, node to node connectivity. It's very dense, uh, and that is a, that is a, just two examples that we we show here. Now, the next thing we're looking at, and this is more theoretical, is that we're interested in uh, using the layer specific information to gorge how much uh, spatial resolution we can get. So this is work in progress by uh, David, who I just showed you, my postdoc. And what we're doing here is that we're using the segmentation of the big brain to adjust it to individual brains. And <clears throat> just to show you the idea, these are the lead fields for each of the layers. Now, we don't know yet if you have, with electrophysiology, the resolution. But having the lead fields is the first step, and we're now looking at the full width at half max, uh, and we're trying to see if with 
the, uh, certain sparsity and additional constraints, how much uh, we can actually specify about the origin of uh, different signals in uh, different layers of the cortex. Now, <clears throat> this is all alignment to the big brain. I said at the outset that we would like to use the information that's available from other sources, chemoreceptors. Uh, uh, we would like to look at the, uh, as we did in, in, a, in our earlier paper, at uh, connectivity of different sources, uh, different types, no? Be it from real anatomical connectivity or it's surrogate uh, by diffusion weighted imaging. Now, what can tie these things together? Well, one approach which has been very fruitful is to do just a data-driven uh, analysis of the relation between electrophysiology, fMRI, and different char anatomical characteristics. But we think that maybe, as we did in, this, uh, in, in our study some years ago, that maybe a good approach would be to do this in a model-based way, that is to say, model-based uh, fusion of multimodal imaging. And uh, for this, well, <laughs> I have to say that, that we started this type of work with narrow mass models uh, many years ago, in the late 90s, uh, producing the first, uh, it's, it's now known as DCM, but the first inference of uh, neural uh, circuits parameters from narrow mass models based on stochastic differential equations. In this paper, which is the review that I'm telling you, we take the approach and what you see at the left was an actual simulation we did where we modeled the thalamus, we modeled the visual cortex, and then we tried to reproduce and were able to reproduce the correlations between EEG and fMRI, which were generated in a forward manner from the narrow mass model. Basically, uh, the direction we've gone to is that uh, connectivity, and that's what I'm putting here on the right, is a, a best measured as a tensor. What does this mean? that you have receiver nodes, you have emitter nodes, but then you have a third dimension, which is time. And these are the delays between uh, uh, different nodes as the, the transmission time of information. So, more mathematically, what we have is that uh, if we consider uh, uh, capital sigma, the brain uh, surface, we have the Cartesian product of brain surface by brain surface, which is emitters to uh, receivers, and then we have the additional dimension of delays. Now, we've fully followed this idea up by uh, now working, and I want to mention, this is work of Anis Lady Gonzalez, she just finished the PhD with me, and is going to work at, uh, with Alan uh, now, and uh, what we did was to take what we call the connecton tensor, and to find a very efficient way of doing uh, narrow mass simulations. Uh, essentially, each narrow mass is a random differential equation. We can make it as specific as we want. And then you can uh, do this uh, in, uh, first, it can be done on a PC where you can get up to a thousand different nodes in reasonable time if you parallelize it uh, it can be even faster, and this is an essential uh, ingredient of being able to solve the inverse problem, which yesterday uh, Blake was mentioning, that uh, if you can't fit the model, if you can't select the model, if you can't optimize the model, then it falls out of what's mathematically and computationally tractable. The ingredient to doing this is having a very fast forward solution, and I think that's exactly what we have. Basically, uh, any narrow mass model, we just take one there, is a random uh, differential equation. We, ain't, we add white noise on it. Uh, you have the narrow mass, you have the input, the output. For example, the famous Jensen and Rick, which, which is actually the, uh, the Lopez da Silva and Zetterberg model. They did it before. Uh, you have a series of narrow masses, which then you can combine with intrinsic uh, computation, uh, connections, I'm sorry, then using the connecton tensor, and this is a notation, this is the Penrose notation on the left. A tensor has as many sticks going out of its dimensions, and uh, the operations can be by, uh, let's say, by uh, just combining these sticks. This is a, a very convenient notation. 
So basically, that's the classical neural mass model with a connectivity matrix. We substitute it now with what we call the connectome tensor. And this uh, connectome or connectivity tensor allows for very efficient, uh, because there's uh, many ways to do efficient tensor uh, operations on distributed uh, uh, computation. Now, what does this allow you to have also a connectome tensor? We know that the distribution of mere lane uh, uh, diameters is not uniform. And in fact, uh, there is a, uh, this leads to a series of distributed delays from one uh, cortical area to the other. So what we were able to do with this approach is to build that in. And uh, so here, basically, what we tried is the usual, you can have zero lag or you can have just a delta direct, which means that you're considering that there's only one conduction velocity, and that's very usual in bottling. And we were able to test a distributed delay like this, which we took from studies by Paul Nunes, no? And that's the one that we introduced as a new thing. And basically what we did was to be able to build up a Janssen and RIP model now, which was connected with cortical, -cortical connections. And briefly, what I'm showing you here is that the dynamics uh, what are the spectral peaks? I won't mention, but we're studying higher order spectra too. Will depend both on the topology, which is on the left, the different topologies of connections and the different types of distributions. And it depends very delicately on this. One note, which I just want to finish, is that, it, that uh, many methods that are used for integrating these narrow masses are very naive. For example, the, uh, the things like the euler maruyama method. And what I'm showing here is a, a, just a simple simulation, which is in the paper, in which when you use the correct method, which is local linearization, which preserves the dynamics of the system, uh, because it locally preserves the Jacobian of the whole system, you can get a limit cycle. But if you use any of the other methods, for example, euler maruyama what you get out is a mess. So this is an added bonus to this uh, toolbox. So basically, uh, this is what I wanted to say. The conclusions are uh, that uh, we have uh, presented methods and software for electrophysiology. Uh, it's trying to get to big brain compatible atlases. We've improved some connectivity theory to obtain higher accuracy uh, for source connectivity. We, have, we, have, we now have dedicated pipelines for this purpose that uh, also incorporate the use of layer specific, this is the part that's in research. And this work goes hand in hand with high dimensional narrow mass modeling to try to facilitate multimodal narrow imaging fusion. Okay, that's the conclusion. Questions for Pedro? One right there. The microphone. Hi. Um, I'm sorry if I missed it, if you already mentioned it, but I'm curious the exact registration method you used between big brain and FS average. So you were showing Conrad's layer superimposed on FS average, and you talked quite a bit about it, but what was the registration? No, the registration we lifted from uh, the standard pipelines, okay? So it would be the previous one that you presented this morning, not the, mo not, not the more modern one. As soon as the, the default MSM. Yeah, the default. We use the default there. Okay. It was MSM. It wasn't uh, embedded in freeze. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. That one. Thank you. So you can use. The no, we can use. I mean, we, the, we're, precisely the reason they're coming here is to say, "Hey, we're here." We should talk. Yeah, we will. Hi. Thanks for a really interesting talk. So, for that last model, that uh, the tensor method for doing your delays. Um, is every component of that model differentiable? Uh, every component of the model, not only is it differentiable, we, okay, to explain, thanks for the question, no? What we do is we use local linearization. That means that we integrate over a, a time step. So we take the Jacobian of the model, everything, we integrate it, and we obtain explicit 
method, uh, symbolic calculations. That's why it speeds up. So we have a fast tensor operation, and then we have a step where we have pre-computed what is the integration step uh, symbolically. So that makes it pretty fast. You should be able to run gradients through that to optimize all the parameters. Yes, we can. We can. We can. That's why, uh, that, that's the email. That's why I sent you the paper, yeah. because I think that, that. that this approach uh, allows perhaps bringing together closer the biophysical modeling and the artificial neural networks. I mean, I hope that would be a, a research direction. Cool. Thanks.